So employee stock options for reg is mostly concerned with when is the income taxable to the employee who receives the stock options because sometimes receiving stock options is like receiving additional wages and compensation. And sometimes it isn't. So we got to know when receiving stock options is a taxable event because corporations often grant their employees the option to purchase shares of stock in the corporation at a designated price, say $20 a share. The employee may or may not choose to exercise the option. The decision to exercise the option and buy the shares would be based on a comparison of the market price of the stock with the option price. And while the option price doesn't change, the market price of the stock changes. So the employee is holding an option maybe to buy the shares at 20. But if the market price is 15, then the employee would not exercise her option. But if the market price went up to 40 or anything higher than 20, then it would be tempting to exercise the option at 20 because then you could buy the stock, turn around and sell it. So there's a lot of different types of stock options. Some are taxable right away. They call that on the grant date. Like when you get the options granted to you, they call that the grant date. And sometimes there's a taxable event that day. And we've got to know for the reg exam when the options are taxable on the grant date. And if they're not taxable on the grant date, then when are they taxable? Maybe they're taxable when you exercise the option. So that's what we're going to try to work out. Look at number three. Amy works for Oracle Inc. and on January 25th, year 13, receives an option to buy 200 shares of Oracle stock at a price of $20 per share. And at the date of grant, the market price of Oracle stock is $18.95 a share. Amy would wait to exercise her option until the market price of Oracle stock is selling above 20. Because if she could pay 1895 right now, she wouldn't exercise at this point because why would she pay 20 when she could pay 1895 at the market? Right, she has to wait until the stock is selling for above 20 because if she can exercise and buy the shares using her option, she would have to pay 20 because that's her option price. That never changes. Her option price never changes. What changes is the market price. And right now the market's $18.95. Yeah, she would wait until the price of the stock is like 25 in the market. So then she'll buy in at her option price of 20. And then she could turn around and sell it for 25. If the market price is 18.95 and she buys in for 20, then she's only going to be able to sell it for 18.95. You see, she wouldn't, she wouldn't buy at 20 and exercise her option when she could go to the market and buy it at 18.95. She could go online and buy it through the TD Ameritrade brokerage account that she has and pay 18.95. Why would she exercise an option and pay 20? She wouldn't do it until the stock is selling above 20. So this is the idea about stock options. We haven't talked about what's taxable yet, just a preview of where we're going. So she's granted these options She's not doing anything yet. All she's doing is saying, thank you for giving me this option to buy the stock at $20 a share. But right now, I'm not going to exercise that option because the market price is $18.95. And if I want to buy the stock, I'll just buy it for $18.95. So she wouldn't exercise her option unless and until the market price of the stock takes off a little bit and goes above 20 
then it would pay for her to exercise. They call that in the money options. When you have an option to buy a 20 and everybody else has to pay a higher price, then your option's in the money. Right now, her option's not in the money. There'd be no reason to exercise. She would just buy the stock at 1895 if she wanted to own it at all. Now, let's advance to June 18th, year 14. Where were we before? We were at January 25th, year 13. Now we're at June 18th, year 14, over a year later. The market price of the stock is now 30 a share. And she's holding an option to buy 200 shares for how much? She can buy them for the option price of 20. Right? Her option price never changes. She was granted an option to buy 200 shares at 20. That option price... She can exercise it at 20 until it expires. So as long as these options haven't expired yet, she has the option to buy 200 shares for 20. She doesn't have to buy it, but if she wants to exercise her option, she's going to pay 20 per share. She doesn't get the shares for free. She's got to pay $20 a share for the 200 shares, and now would be a good time to exercise the option because the market price of the stock is higher. It's 30 these options are in the money now because she could exercise for 20 and invest $4,000. You see why that would be a $4,000 investment? Right. She's going to pay $20 a share for 200 shares. That's a $4,000 cash investment. She could then immediately turn around and sell them at the market price of 30 and receive a profit of $2,000 if she did that. That would be a short-term capital gain since she only held the shares for less than a year. So she'd be in a very good situation if she was holding 200 shares, an option to purchase 200 shares for 20 and the market price was 30. She'd be wishing that she had more options to buy more shares at this point, where before, when she was first granted the options, it wasn't very exciting back then when the market price was 1895. So the option price, what they call the strike price or the exercise price, all that's the same term. The option price, the strike price, the exercise price, that never changes. Her option price is 20. What changes is the market price of the stock. And as the market price of the stock changes, the options either have value or they don't have value. Whereas they didn't really have a lot of value on slide three when the stock was trading for 1895. They had some time value because the options have some time. That's the beauty that's the beautiful thing about options, is that even when they're not in the money today, if you still have several months, a year or two, then you hold on to them because they have time value. But then when you get to slide four, now the option is in the money. Very valuable. Because now you can buy a 200 or a, you can buy 200 shares for 20, $4,000 investment. You can turn it to $6,000. That difference of 2,000, if she turns around and sells it right away, would be a $2,000 short-term capital gain, since she only held the shares for less than a year. So that's the basics of options. Now we're going to get into the specifics: non-qualified versus qualified. There's two types of employee stock options. You have non-qualified options and qualified options. And what are they qualifying for? Well, when you have to qualify for something, if you can qualify for it, it's good news for you. So what is the whole idea here? What are we trying to qualify for with a qualified option? We're trying to qualify for no tax at the date of grant. We're trying to qualify for no tax, no taxable income at the date of grant, no taxable income on the exercise date either, if we can qualify for that. But not every option qualifies. So they'll tell you on the exam if the option qualifies or not. You won't have to determine it. You'll just have to know what to do about it. So on slide six, a non-qualified option, we'll take care of that first. If it doesn't qualify for tax exemption, 
then when you get these options, it's taxable when you are awarded these options. It's like compensation. It'll go on your W-2 form and be additional income. Why? Because it's non-qualified. It doesn't qualify for any exemption. So the question is, when is it going to hit your W-2 form? We know it's going to if it's non-qualified option. We know it's going to hit your W-2. Well, a non-qualified option is taxed when granted if the option has a readily ascertainable value on the day of grant. And some options do have a readily ascertainable value. Most of your stocks on the stock market have what they call option trading associated with the stock. And as the stock price moves up and down, the price of the related options move up and down. The options give you the right to buy the stock for a certain price on or before a certain date. After that, the options expire. So where the stock goes, the options go. So most of your options of Fortune 500 companies have a readily ascertainable value. So the question is, if you receive an option with a readily ascertainable value, then it's taxable income to you when you receive it. As soon as it's granted to you, you have a taxable income. It's going right on your W-2 like additional compensation. Yeah, in the exam, they're going to tell you that the option has a readily ascertainable value of $2. Or it'll tell you that the option has no readily ascertainable value. So if the option has a readily ascertainable value when granted, then it's income to you immediately when the option is granted. Otherwise, if there's no readily ascertainable value for that option that you were just granted, then the income, the option is taxed when you exercise the option, then it's taxable. And if you don't exercise the option, then it's never taxed. So there's some dates we got to be aware of because sometimes we're taxed on the grant date and sometimes we're taxed on the exercise date. And what's the difference? Well, the grant date is the date that Amy is granted the options. So let's say she's granted an option to buy 100 shares of Oracle on January 1st, year 5. And let's say the option has a readily ascertainable value of $10. So the option's worth $10 on the day it's granted to Amy. Then she's going to be taxed on $1,000 of income right away, day one, when the options are granted. 100 shares times $10 option value. That's not the stock's value. That's the option's value, $10, okay? Forget about what the stock is worth today. We're going by what the option's worth we want to know if the option has a readily ascertainable value, we multiply the option price times the number of shares that she could buy with those options, and that's her income on the W-2. She would be taxed on $1,000 of income. Whether she exercises the options or never exercises the options, she's going to have $1,000 on this year's W-2 for year five. Yeah, 100 shares, if she has an option to buy 100 shares and they have a readily ascertainable value of $10. That's not the stock price, that's the option value. That's right. So it's $1,000 of income to Amy on the grant date. So if she made uh, on her W-2 $300,000 from Oracle this year, then she'd have 301000 on her W-2 because of this extra income from being granted non-qualified stock options. Is it important that they're non-qualified? Yes, because if they were qualified, we'd keep that $1,000 off the W-2. It wouldn't be there if it were qualified. But because it's non-qualified, you got to put that value of the option on the W-2. On the grant date, it's taxed. So oh, that's right. That's right. What if it's not a readily ascertainable value? We said $10 is what the options are worth today 
What if we didn't know? What if the exam told us no readily ascertainable value? Well, then the option is not taxable on the grant date. It would only be taxable if she exercises the option. We'll show you what's going to happen there. So Pam's going to receive 100 non-qualified employee stock options from her employer, Party Plus, Inc. And they tell us the options have a readily ascertainable value of a dollar. And each option provides the right to purchase 10 shares of her company stock for $5 a share. She received the options four years ago when the stock was trading for $4 per share. Pam exercises all the options when the stock is selling for $25 per share. All they want to know is how much income does she recognize at the grant date, which happens to have been four years ago. How much income back then? Well, there's a hundred non-qualified options. Each one gives her the right to buy 10 shares. So now we're up to a thousand options, right? Or a thousand shares, actually. A hundred options times 10 shares. So she has the right to buy a thousand shares and they have a readily ascertainable value of a dollar. So you're going to multiply that 1,000 shares times $1, and the income to her on the grant date four years ago is $1,000, letter D. Well, the stock was selling for $4 a share when she was awarded the options. Her option price is $5 a share. That means if she wants to exercise the options and buy the stock, what's her strike price? She can exercise her option and pay $5 a share. But none of that is evident yet. We don't know what she's going to do. And then it says, oh, yeah, she did exercise all the options, and the stock is selling for 25 Would that be a good time for her to exercise the options when the stock's selling for 25 Oh, yeah. Yep, so she'll buy it for five and she could sell it for 25. Right. Exactly. So all they asked in this question was, what's the income to her on the grant date? And you'd say $1,000 because there's a right to buy 1,000 shares and the options are worth a dollar each. So $1,000 is the income on the grant date. That's ordinary income, goes on her W-2. And oh yeah, by the way, her employer can take a deduction of $1,000 in the same year, in the year that she's taxed. So it's $1,000 of income for Pam, $1,000 deduction for Party Plus. All right, let's go on to 21. We're going to see a little bit more how this develops. So same thing. Pam receives 100 non-qualified employee stock options from her employer, Party Plus, Inc. The options have a readily ascertainable value of a dollar. Each option provides the right to purchase 10 shares of her company stock for $5 a share. All that's the same. What are they asking this time? How much income does Pam recognize at the exercise date? the day she buys the shares. What's her strike price? She can exercise at $5. She could buy for five, turn around and sell for 25. So all they want to know is when she exercises her options and buys for $5, it's going to cost her $5 times a thousand shares is going to cost her five thousand dollars. 
but well she's already been taxed on the grant date how much did we tax her on the grant date a thousand dollars right back in the previous question so she already exactly because it was readily ascertainable she was taxed already on the grant date the exercise date is not a taxable event because she's already been taxed it's only going to be taxed once at, right it's either going to be taxed at the grant date or the exercise date but not both so in this case she's taxed at the grant date why because it has a readily ascertainable value so the exercise date there's no income the answer is zero letter a today for her the day she exercises is only a purchase date just a purchase of shares what did it cost her five dollars times a thousand shares cost her five thousand dollars on the exercise date it cost her five thousand dollars to buy the stock she doesn't get the stock for free, right? She has to exercise the, the option and buy the stock if she wants it. Well, that's what we're going to get up to. So go to 23. We'll get to what her gain is, but let's see what her basis is for the shares purchase because this might surprise you. Go to 23. Pam received, once again, 100 non-qualified employee stock options. What they want to know this time is what's her basis for the shares purchased. All we know so far is she just bought the stock for $5,000. So maybe the answer is A. Her basis is $5,000. And it wouldn't be a bad guess, but it's not right. And the reason why is because the income that we taxed her on already on the grant date was $1,000. Remember that? We're going to add that to her basis. So her basis for, the, for this now is $6,000, letter B. Right, add her investment, add to her investment of $5,000, add to that what she's already been taxed on, $1,000. Otherwise, when you sell this option, you're going to be taxed on that $1,000 twice. Right, so she's been taxed on a thousand already. Let's add that to the cost of five thousand to give her a six thousand dollar basis. Letter B, because it's already been taxed since it's a readily ascertainable, non-qualified option. And now we're going to answer the question: How much gain does she recognize on the sale of the shares? Go to twenty-five. Well, we know she sold it for $30, they're telling us now. She exercised all the options when the stock was selling for $25, but then she held it for a while. And she's pretty smart because it went up to $30 two years later. So now at $30, she's going to sell all the shares, and her proceeds are going to be 30,000 proceeds, and then we're going to subtract the cost basis of 6,000, and she's going to have a nice $24,000 gain, which we're going to call a long-term capital gain because she held it for two years, more than a year after she exercised it. So the exercise date is the holding period start date. She exercises, and the holding period starts. Two years later, she sold it, long-term capital gain. So in the final analysis, her total gain was 25,000. 24,000 was a capital gain, and 1,000 was ordinary income. Back when she first was granted the options, we said they had a readily ascertainable value of one dollar, and that's why she was taxed back then for 1,000. Now she's being taxed 24,000 total of 25,000 over the life of this event right she first had a thousand dollars of income and then she exercised and then when she sold the stock she had a twenty four thousand dollar gain so in the final analysis her total gain on this twenty five thousand 
So you'd have to know that $1,000 was ordinary income and $24,000 was long-term capital gain. Right, she got it from her employer and had $1,000 of ordinary income. And then when she was taxed on the sale, it was a difference of the $30,000 proceeds. See where we got the $30,000? Less the cost basis, which we said was the 1000 original plus the 5000 cost. The 6000 basis was compared to the 30000 proceeds. And she has a $24,000 capital gain. And she already had $1,000 of ordinary income. So she wound up being taxed on a total of 25000 but the character of it is different. $1,000 is ordinary income, goes on a W-2. $24,000 is a capital gain, it'll go on Schedule D. All right, now let's take a look at non-qualified options where there is no readily ascertainable value. You ready? We're going to walk through the same example, but there's not going to be a readily ascertainable value. Okay? Hey, it's Darius for more CPA exam reg videos. Visit cpaexamtutoring.com.